Or you can see the black humps come way, way out. The whole area was like a feeding frenzy. You just can't have 1,200 to 1,300 credible people seeing something in the lake and not have some substance to it. I believe there's definitely something in the lake. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something large, and there's a few of them. My name is Bill Stasiak, and I am the Legend Hunter. British Columbia, bordered by the Pacific Ocean and filled with beautiful rivers and lakes, it is a popular destination for vacationers worldwide. But while tourists and locals enjoy these unforgettable waterways, they may also come face to face with two of the province's most enduring legends, the Cadborosaurus near Victoria and Ogopogo in Okanagan Lake. Described in native legends, both creatures have been a part of Western Canadian folklore for hundreds of years. But some people believe there is more to British Columbia's sea creatures than quaint stories. Longtime Kelowna resident Bill Stasiak is one of them. A real estate agent by day, Bill became interested in the legends of British Columbia 30 years ago. It was then that he spotted Lake Okanagan's most famous resident. It was October 1978. At that point in time, I was living on the west side of the lake, and uh, I was coming into work. And I was coming down across the bridge, and I looked over to my right, and lo and behold, there were three humps in the water moving towards Kelowna. So at that point, I stopped my car. This was basically in the middle of the bridge, and backed all the traffic up, all the way up the hill behind me. And I had all these people out, over the rail looking at the sighting, and it was really something. Seeing Ogopogo that fateful day changed Bill's life. Since then, he has vowed to prove that British Columbia's mysterious sea creatures are real. Bill first decided to take a thorough scientific approach in his attempt to find indisputable proof of Ogopogo's existence. No one's really done a scientific search. So in 2000, we put together a huge crew. We had upwards of 50 people. And we did a three-week search for Ogopogo. And it was great. And ever since then, we've been doing it every year or every second year. Okanagan Lake, one of the largest in the region, boasts a remarkable 87,000 acres of surface area, giving Ogopogo plenty of room to hide. Still, it seems that this mythical beast emerges from the depths regularly, and when it does, it has often been observed. In fact, there have been as many recorded sightings of Ogopogo as the famed Loch Ness Monster. Many of these sightings involve multiple witnesses, but that's not all. According to Bill, more people have seen Ogopogo than will admit to it. We did this survey in 99, we pulled 1,000 residents of the Okanagan. Mm -hmm. And we had one simple question, and the question was, if you saw something in the lake that you didn't know what it is, would you report it? Well, we found that 90% of the people would not yeah, report it. reporting it. 10% would. Now, if you go back over the last 100 years and all the sightings, there's something like 1,200 sightings total. Well, if that only represents 10 percent, you do the math. Number of sightings. Yeah. You guys do the math on that. Fortunately for Bill, there are some people so convinced that they have seen Ogopogo they can't help but report it. Steve Lavely is one of them. Two years ago, while boating in the middle of the lake, Steve and some friends decided to go for a swim. It was then that they realized they weren't alone. All of a sudden, I noticed some weird kind of waves. And as a joke, I kind of yelled at everybody that was swimming, oh, look, it's Ogopogo. 
So everybody kind of, you know, started looking on, what is that anyway? And what it was was some really weird wave formations. It had like a V at the front, and then behind the V was three really large humps. And it wasn't just going in a straight line. This thing was moving and sort of zigzagging around. We decided we were going to chase it in the boat, see if we could get closer to it. We finally followed it into this little bay sort of area. There was three or four more of these wave things all sort of zigzagging around in the, in the little bay area. Before it happened, I was kind of, you know, the average skeptic, just whatever, could be anything. And then once that happened, I kind of, I, I believe there's definitely something in the lake. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something large and there's a few of them and they're in there for sure. While collecting eyewitness stories, Bill has found that most accounts have a few common denominators. A typical local pogo sighting is the classic three humps, two humps. Uh, sometimes a head is seen, but generally these sightings are at a distance. They generally are, are moving uh, laterally across the lake from people. Bill learns of a very recent sighting and calls his legend hunting partner Len Milnick. Len! Hey, how you doing? Hey, listen, did you hear about that Ogopogo sighting in the mission? Yeah, something, eh? Listen, I got a plan. You gonna be around this afternoon? Great, see you then. Len Melnick owns Can Pro Diving. His diving skills and resources are an invaluable aid to the team's quest for Ogopogo. Like Bill, Len has his own reasons for believing that Ogopogo exists. Hey, Len! Hey, how you doing? Hey, did you hear about it? I haven't visually seen, you know, like Ogopogo, for instance, but I've, I've, I've had that feeling underwater, like something was watching me. And uh, that's how I got involved with Bill Stasiak, uh, just doing this search. Lynn's business provides commercial diving services throughout Western Canada. He supplies the legend hunting team with high-tech diving equipment, underwater photography and video. His divers are not only certified and experienced, but they also share Len and Bill's desire to find Ogopogo. Now, my thinking is, is we come here, we check out the site, where they had the sighting, we do sonar sweeps up the troughs, to Rattlesnake Island, check out the caves between Rattlesnake. You've always wanted to do this in Squally Point. Yeah. With a definite plan of action, Bill and Len look forward to finally discovering evidence to prove that Ogopogo actually exists. Legend hunter Bill Stasiak has spent the last 30 years trying to prove the existence of the elusive Ogopogo that lives in Okanagan Lake in British Columbia. Bill and his partner Len Melnick have organized a diving team to search for the creature and find evidence to prove that the mythical Ogopogo, seen by hundreds of people, is in fact real. Well, we're just getting all our stuff uh, together to uh, go look for search for Ogopogo. We've got our sonar coming in, we've got uh, GPS, we've got, uh, we're just waiting on my buddy Wayne with his Zodiac, we've got the scuba divers coming in. Ah, it's gonna be an exciting day. Okanagan Lake is an impressive four kilometers or 2.5 miles wide and 135 kilometers or 75 miles long. It will be a challenge to pin down the elusive Ogopogo in this massive body of water. Well, Lake Okanagan is also one of the deepest uh, lakes in British Columbia, if not one of the deepest lakes in North America. In some places, just to the sediment level, it's 1,000 feet. To search for Ogopogo in a lake of this size requires the best equipment and the best team. Jay Sinclair is one such team member. I'm going to jack of all trades. If there's any driving, anything to do with any of the boat maintenance, repairs, I'm the guy, I'm gonna be a support diver as well, so I can get down there and help out where I can and uh, see if we can catch this guy, this Ogopogo. Also joining the team is Wayne Calloway, who brings his Zodiac, a portable boat that is both fast and maneuverable. And I'm here to see Ogopogo and get a picture of him. When he does appear, it's briefly, and he's moving in the water 
quite fast, which is why I have my Zodiac so we can catch him. He's out here somewhere. With the team together, they head for the location of the most recent Ogopogo sighting. Okay, uh, we're heading out to uh, Squally Point here, which is the infamous uh, location where the uh, Ogopogo is known to uh, hang out. According to native legend, Ogopogo makes his home in a cave at Squally Point. The First Nations people called the sea monster Naha'aikt, meaning lake sea serpent. Naha'aikt was a demon-possessed man who murdered a local named Old Kunhikun. The native gods punished Naha'aikt by turning him into a giant sea serpent and condemning the creature to live forever in the lake. The lake was then named after the murdered man. For the First Nations people, it's a very sacred, uh, a sacred creature. They would take a sacrifice on the water with them when they went on the water to appease the lake monster. It wasn't until the 20th century that the creature acquired its present name. Ogopogo became well known in the 1930s. As a matter of fact, his name, uh, Ogopogo, is not an Indian word. It uh, was from a uh, vaudeville show. And uh, there's actually a little song, an Ogopogo song. The team arrives at Squally Point and prepares for their first dive. Yeah, I know it's, it's pretty exciting. This particular cave that we're going to be diving to, uh, I don't think anybody's ever been in it before, so. Bill, get your Speedos. You're going in the water. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the advantage of using divers are is you, could, you could use divers to locate a cave. If there's some evidence of something that was in that cave, you'd want to search that immediate area. It's, this particular cave is in, what, 20, 30 feet of water. So I guess we could send our guys in and locate it and yeah. uh, go from there. Yeah. OK, great. Let's do her. Diving conditions at Squally Point can be dangerous and unpredictable. Only the most experienced divers, Craig Smalley and Neil Close, will be making the dive. Weather can pick up at any moment and change the diving conditions in a matter of minutes. I think we have to have dry suits keep us warm. Uh, so what happens with that is we end up with more gear, makes it more cumbersome for the diver. And here we're, we're looking for some caves. Caves are another dangerous point. You can have overhanging rock that bubbles can dislodge and fall down. Neil and Craig descend into the frigid depths of Lake Okanagan, the alleged home of a giant sea serpent. And you always wonder, well, what am I going to do when I finally come across one of those? Then little simple things like that go through your mind. Am, am I going to be the first to get eaten? Am I the first to, <laughs> get, to get sucked in touched? Or, or, yeah. you know? But uh, it keeps you going, you know? Like, it's uh, definitely... That's part of the... Uh... The adrenaline rush of it all, that's what we all uh, crave. Crave. That's why, we, that's why we do it. My thoughts on the Ogopogo is there could possibly be, you know, something left over or something that has remained in the deeper waters. We know through our research that it lives on the bottom. Uh, we know that it, it's a predator. We know that because of the sightings where the teeth were shown in the head. The divers complete a thorough investigation of the area thought to be Ogopogo's home. They return to the surface and report to Bill. So how things go down there, guys? Good. Good? Very good. Did you find that uh, cavern entrance? We didn't find much of an actual cavern entrance. A lot of it could have been covered by landslides. Not big enough for big enough size. So it could have collapsed. Since. Could have collapsed over the years. There has been a lot of land, like you can see the debris along the bottom. There has been a lot of land in there. Okay. Okay. The team eliminates Squally Point as an active lair for Ogopogo. It's time to move on to the next location in their bid to find evidence of the mysterious creature in Okanagan Lake, where the next underwater search will push the scuba divers 
to their physical limits. Okay, I guess we're all ready to go. Legend hunter Bill Stasiak has assembled a team to search Okanagan Lake for the elusive creature known as Ogopogo. The diving team has already explored Squally Point, and they prepare for their second dive at another location known for Ogopogo sightings. The water around Rattlesnake Island is a good location to search for Ogopogo. Not only is it close to the creature's traditional home, it is the perfect environment for a large aquatic animal. It's deep, yeah, you'll get a lot of fish just kind of swimming around. Uh, Ogopogo is known to just kind of come to the surface, and uh, usually boats and divers can scare him, so he likes to be where he can get deep, right? So this is a really nice area. There's no other area on the Okanagan Lake that uh, offers so much protection, plus abundance of aquatic life and food. The team narrows in on another underwater rock formation that is known to have caves. Neil and Craig make their second dive of the day. So you think uh, these caves that we're going to be having a look at here, Neil, what, uh, what depth are they? I think they vary anywhere from 20 to 100 feet in depth. Acting as diving and technical support, team member Bob Cook prepares the underwater camera and light that the divers will use to record their findings. Len Melnick sets up the monitoring equipment. Just do it for a lot of inspection dives. Uh, today we see some of the uh, locations where we feel that maybe Ogopogo might be hanging around. The underwater terrain off Rattlesnake Island is much more treacherous than Squally Point. So for added safety, Neil Close will explore the caves using hard hat diving gear with surface supplied oxygen. It's an air redundant system. There's two uh, air systems on the surface. The diver carries a air system on his back as well. He's, he's tethered. He has voice communications to the surface, so if he needs something, they can send it down to him, or he, if he needs help, they can help him. Once again, Neil Close slips beneath the surface and begins his long descent into the depths of Lake Okanagan. Cave diving can be extremely dangerous. When a diver encounters trouble inside an underwater cavern, Getting out of the tight space can present a grave risk. Team members on the boat closely monitor the diver's progress through radio communication and video. Well, this is a perfect location for Ogopogo to search for Ogopogo. It's dark, it's dark, deep. west side of Rattlesnake Island, the traditional home of Ogopogo. 50 feet deep. Yeah, 50. Now, my understanding is Neil said that that's a sure drop straight down. 300, yeah, or, 300 or over there. That's what it looks like oh, on the map. It's quite deep there. Can you even see the bottom? Wow. Close 300 feet here, Bob. Deep, deep, eh? The divers find the rock formation and begin searching for a cave entrance. Down. You can hear his straining because he's so steep that yeah, he's, yeah. he's pulling himself. Yeah. They're trying to balance themselves on the side of a cliff and yeah. it's yeah, like uh, repelling down a down a wall. So it's uh, it's not an easy dive to make. Exploring underwater rock formations during a hard hat dive is much like mountain climbing, complete with a risk of falling. If I sunk, it would be tough because, I mean, everything that would be racing through your mind would be the last things, but also at the same time, it would be a, a, a game of survival. You would be, you know, ditching all your uh, weight belts and trying to make yourself buoyant and, and uh, filling your suits up and definitely be trying to climb the cliff or to hang on to the ledge or, you know, to, to get yourself back up, back to the surface. the divers discover a possible lair for the creature. Oh, I got something that looks like a cave. You got something that looks like a cave? Yeah. You're in the mouth of the cave right now. I'm right inside it. Roger. Oh, murky. 
Of all, there's the excitement of trying to locate one of these caves or caverns, and, yes. and then when you get to the cave, but you just don't swim in front of it. You slowly go over the edge and peer yeah, in. Make to sure that entrance make is sure clear. It's clear. You know, you know what I mean? You, you just don't, don't know what's there. Yeah. yeah. And then you slowly start working your way in, and but there's just just that adrenaline going, just like I said, just like a kid exploring. After searching the caves and the icy lake, it is time for the divers to return to the surface. Okay, we should probably pull Neil pretty quick here, guys. Yeah, he's running out of air. Well, he's running out of time. Okay. All right, Neely, if you want to leave bottom, bud, that'd be great. The divers confirm that the Rattlesnake Island caves could be an ideal refuge for Ogopogo, but once again, they find no evidence to prove that they have found the creature's home. Uh, yeah. Well, good stuff, guys. I mean, that's uh, unfortunately no Ogopogo. Fortunately, no Ogopogo today. No. Well, no. it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, well, yeah. well, we know it is, but uh, it wasn't in that cave. It wasn't in that, that cave. Anyway, great stuff, guys. Thanks. While the team didn't see Ogopogo on day one of their search, they aren't discouraged. Every mission gives the team more experience for future dives. The next day, Bill decides to use a different method to search for Ogopogo, one that will allow them to cover a much greater area in their search. The team will be using sonar to track down the famed lake monster. No one's ever used any sonar on the lake, and certainly we shopped around for the best type to use, and we found this was our best, the best way to go about it. And sonar doesn't lie. I mean, you know, a signal is sent out, and a return comes back, and it's shown on the screen, and uh, logs don't float at 60 meters below the lake. Sonar is a reliable method of locating large aquatic animals, such as Ogopogo, because it's quiet and non-invasive it's less likely to scare the shy creature into hiding. Joining the Legend Hunter team today is Wade Koenig. Early season, late season, you'll pick up more sightings because people are tendency to see flatter water. So they got a better shot of, of waves or anything on the lake. There's a number of sightings all the time. Many skeptics believe that Ogopogo sightings are nothing more than wave formations. Steve Garrity believed that until his own experience with Ogopogo two years ago. It was on uh, Thanksgiving Day, October 11th, 2004, and I was just coming here with a dog walking the dog. And as I was looking at the lake, I said, well, that's probably where a lot of the Ogopogo sightings are, it's just from strange wave actions. And then no sooner am I thinking that is when I see these two objects come on the water. Now, they're pretty well black. The forward one of the two was actually coming up with some black humps. And my first reaction was, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Steve moved to a higher vantage point for a better look. And I saw another one in the same spot, just one of them, and it was really moving. It was, the humps were just coming out of the water, and it was at that point that I was pretty well convinced that I'd actually seen the, uh, seen the creature. The location where Steve Garrity first spotted Ogopogo is part of a larger area where many other sightings have been reported. It will be the place where the legend hunting team conducts their search. Not far from where Bill had his first Ogopogo sighting, the sonar scanner picks something up. There's two of you on here. Yeah, I picked it up just underneath the alarm range. Okay. Yes, it. it I'm still reading 40 meters, 34 meters, what'd you say? 450 here? It looks like a solid read, and Bill decides to send divers in to look for the target found by the sonar. The divers look for anything that could explain such a large sonar reading. In 40 meters of water with low visibility, even dark shadows could be Ogopogo, lurking just a few feet away. A few years ago, we were diving at about 70 feet, and I just had a weird feeling, uh, and, I, and I turned, 
and there was a, almost like a black silhouette when I was looking across, across the water. That was my first feeling that there's something, you know, and I've, I've always had that in my, you know, back of my mind. After a thorough search of the area, the divers return. While they didn't see Ogopogo, they also couldn't find anything else that could have caused the sonar reading. Bill will examine the evidence from the sonar reading to determine if it could indeed be evidence of Ogopogo. With a solid sonar hit to consider and a better understanding of the underwater cave system, the team decides to wrap up the expedition in Lake Okanagan. But there's another British Columbian sea monster legend to explore. This one's off the coast of Vancouver Island, and exploring this one may prove to be more dangerous. Legend hunter Bill Stasiuk and his partner Len Melnick are moving their search for sea monsters from Lake Okanagan to Vancouver Island. For more than a hundred years, the waters off the coast of Victoria, from the Strait of Juan de Fuca to the Strait of Georgia, have been home to scores of eyewitness sightings of an elusive sea serpent called Cadborosaurus. Bill and Lynn are interested in ancient aboriginal legends about mysterious sea creatures that could be related to Cadborosaurus. They've heard about some remarkable ancient native markings called petroglyphs that may be relevant to their quest. They meet with Trisha Bland, who works at the East Souk Regional Park, which is located an hour outside of Victoria. I understand we're going out to look at some petroglyphs today. That's right. It will take the truck, the four-wheel drive, and I can take you out there to meet a new Chapa um, gentleman. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. Great. We're on our way right now to uh, some petroglyphs, some Indian paintings that are very close to the ocean. And we have to drive in a little bit, and there's about a 10-minute walk to get there. It's uh, fairly rough getting in. We're hoping to uh, be able to connect some dots in terms of what we see on the wall and how that relates to First, uh, First Nations tradition, and it'll be quite interesting. The Petroglyph Park occupies two hectares of land along the coast and receives thousands of visitors each year. At several locations, ancient carvings on rock faces overlook the sea. A local guide has been arranged to take Bill and Len the rest of the way to the Petroglyphs site. People. Hi. Welcome. Hi. I'm Chief Nachapo from the Chiano Nation. I'd like you to greet you to, to our land. And here's a land where, where, where the abundance was huge. There was so many fish here. And we're going down to the petroglyphs over here. And my relatives from 500 years ago put it there to show everyone that this place was looked after environmentally. And I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's always a blessing when someone who wants to hear about the, the past, because the past is, is the vision of our future. It's mm -hmm. whom we are. The Chianu First Nation, like many Aboriginal peoples, believe in maintaining a balanced relationship with the environment. The creature illustrated in the petroglyph bears some striking similarities to eyewitness descriptions of Cadborosaurus, also called Caddy. It has been described as having a horse-like face with no visible ears. It is also said to have whiskers and eight-inch fangs. This creature was placed here to ensure that there would be an environmental balance in all of our fishery, and also to, to persuade uh, uh, other visitors that there's a creature here that could dispatch them should they get greedy. Because well, harmony was important. Well, you know, Chief, uh, we're down here investigating just that. So this diagram we have here, which is three to 400 years old, this could represent a sea serpent, possibly caddy, that lives in the, in the straits out here. It's possible. Chief Nuchapa has good reason to believe that caddy lives in the nearby waters, 
He has had more than one experience with the elusive Ketborosaurus. During those the times of uh, severe weather change, where it got really rough out on the water, there'd be a creature that would come out of the water and stand probably 20 to 30 feet above the water. And I've seen it several times, but uh, I was really too afraid, because I was young at that time, to, to, to get a really good description, because I was more looking away. But is there one here? More than likely. Chief New Chapa isn't the only person that Bill and Len find on their expedition who has a caddy story. Trisha Bland surprises them with a story about her mother. Ever since I was a little girl, I can remember her telling me about her and her sister, her older sister and her younger brother, and they'd go out in their leaky rowboat offshore of Victoria. She described it the way that we've all heard about this. It's like a sea serpent. Yes, yes. And it's kind of got undulating movements in the, in the ocean, and it comes up and it goes down, and that's exactly what they saw. How far away was it? How... Close. It was close, so maybe about 50 yards. Like, did they see all the details, like the head oh, and the yeah. humps? And what did they say oh, the head looked like? It was maybe sort of like a dragon, like a sea lion, just a combination. It was? It was huge. They, of course, they were children at the time when they saw it. And um, I just remember them talking about this huge sea monster creature. And of course, because there was local legend and there was local stories, they had all heard from the time they were little. The story that Trisha's mother told deeply affected her daughter's point of view on the Cadborosaurus. I absolutely believe the Cadborosaurus or Caddy um, is here, exists. Yes, I have no doubt whatsoever. The descriptions of Caddy provided by Chief Nuchapa and Trisha Bland coincide with other eyewitness accounts of Cadborosaurus. The similarities of the stories between Caddy and Ogopogo are startling. It was really interesting to find out about the uh, local area sea creature that they call Caddy and the similarities to the Ogopogo that I know we have in the Okanagan. And uh, from the research we've been doing, there's been a lot of sightings. And I, th I really truly believe just what, what, what the chief was saying. Bill and Len plan an expedition to explore the waters off the coast of Victoria and search for Caddy, using some high-tech equipment that they have never tried before. No. Legend hunter Bill Stasiuk and his partner Len Melnick have completed some fascinating research on Cadborosaurus, known by most as Caddy, the sea creature that has been observed off the coast of Victoria. With eyewitness accounts and a First Nations perspective on the creature, they are now ready to take the hunt into Caddy's realm. Oh, hi there. Hey, how are you? You must be Chris. I'm hi. Bill. Bill. This nice is Len. Len. Len, nice to meet Len. you. Len, Chris Roper, good to meet you. I hear we're heading out today. This is the ROV uh, unit right here, is it? Yes, this is uh, the LBV, Little Benthic Vehicle. Okay. And we're going to take it out and go, go explore. Excellent. Bill and Lynn have enlisted the help of Chris Roper, who has some highly specialized gear. A remote-operated vehicle, or ROV, equipped with a camera, and a boat outfitted with radar, sonar, and GPS to go along with it. Chris is up for this quest, having used his ROV on many challenging missions in the past. Well, all sorts uh, from science. Uh, we provide them to a lot of marine laboratories for education, outreach, commercial, a lot of uh, dam facilities, boat owners, people who've got underwater assets uh, buy these so that they can look at their underwater assets, inspect them. Uh, security, a lot of security issues, port and harbor security, those types of stuff for looking for inspecting piers and docks before large cruise ships come in just from a safety concern. Um, the easiest way to think of them really is as an underwater helicopter with a camera on board. And it really is a helicopter because you can hover, you can move forward and backwards. It's like a helicopter in the water. After a brief test with the ROV, the team heads for open water. 
Yeah, we're excited. Okay. We're just leaving Victoria and we've got all our equipment set up on board and going over to Cadborough Bay, just north of here. Uh, and that's when the last sighting of a caddy was done by a couple of university students. So we're going to go into that exact area and we're going to put the ROV down and uh, see what we can find. The crew carefully prepares the ROV and sends it below the surface to begin their search. Okay, pointing away from the ship. Okay, and I'll just take her down to depth there. Heading down. Okay, well, we're just at the bottom now. We're on bottom. 14.6 uh, meters. Hey, that's a nice shot, eh? A lot of current down here. Look at that. So there's the bottom of Cadborough Bay. Yeah, I mean, pretty much a mud bottom. Uh, until we find some rock outcrop, we're not going to see very much life on the bottom. I mean, we're going to see some, some small fish and small bits, but... Well, we know that uh, Caddy, uh, like Ogopogo and Lake Okanagan, is a bottom dweller. So it's, it's important that, you know, where we're going to be looking is very close to the bottom. And this is the uh, location where that known last sighting is. Not saying that he's just around the corner, but he could be. He could be. We're certainly in the area where he was seen last. The ROV has many advantages over other methods of searching the ocean floor. You can have it down there for 10, 12 hours, whereas divers run out of air and they get tired. I put, you know, cold. A lot of times, if you can just be drifting and taking a, a camera shot, there's no noise in that, and you can come upon anything uh, where the noise won't scare it. The ROV continues its investigation of the ocean bottom for 30 minutes, but then difficulties arise. Well, right now we're having a little bit of trouble with the ROV in terms of uh, tide keeps taking us in. We're going to be moving out to a shelf here, which is probably going to be a quarter mile offshore. It looks like there's a bit of a drop off there into about 120, 130 feet of water, and I think that's where we'd like to explore next. The team moves the search to the deeper section of the bay. After making some adjustments to the camera settings, they send it back down into Caddy's potential lair. Right now we've got the ROV out and uh, we're gonna get it down to the bottom here and have a look at, see if some sheer drop-offs that we can, we can find and possibly some caves, um, some caves to look at. Thanks to its powerful thrusters, the ROV soon reaches the bottom. Chris Roper knows how vast the ocean is and believes that's why the hunt for Caddy is so fraught with disappointment. So he just discovered some land cr creatures that they had no idea that existed. And I mean, 21% of the, the surface is land, 79% submerged. So if we can find something on land that we didn't know about, the chances are probably three times using the mass that we're gonna find something in the ocean that we don't know about. Very little current down here. There's a crab sitting there. Well, we're out, uh, we're out here on a shelf. We've got about a 100-foot drop-off here, and we're trying to find that shelf. We're going to follow that shelf down and see if we can find some caves in the side of the, uh, side of the wall. Much of the 300 sightings of Caddy have happened in very much right here in this area. Uh, so, uh, you know, we probably got a home here, and that's what we're looking for. Perhaps the reason for so many Caddy sightings in the area is that the location provides a perfect environment for the creature. Well, you know, this would, uh, this particular location would be an excellent spot for a home of something like Caddy. Uh, area is very rich in nutrients, uh, a lot of hiding places, uh, and he certainly is a predator and there's a lot to prey on here. Oh, definitely, yeah. Lots of fish, lots of seals, sea lions. Yeah. Yeah, lots, you can see lots of plankton, lots of nutrients in the water. It's very, very, very rich. Very rich in life, this area. 
a lot of hiding area too. Oh yeah, it? yeah, definitely caves and. Sure. Well, we're in, we're we're certainly in the right location for these are. This is the exact location that they've had sightings of caddies. So uh, this is rather interesting. After hours of uneventful searching, the team is jolted to attention by a mysterious image. Oh, what was that? Just yep. tilted up a touch, well, we and there would, was a shadow coming just up well, here in the right we, corner. We, we would have it recorded, whatever that, you know, it's just... Legend hunters Bill Stasiuk and Lynn Melnick search for Cadborosaurus in the waters off Victoria, B.C. Aboard the specially equipped boat, the team uses Chris Roper's remote operated vehicle, or ROV, equipped with a camera to search the ocean floor for the elusive sea monster, Caddy. Upon further inspection, a large and mysterious moving object that had caught Bill's eye turns out to be a drifting plant. But in the same area, the team makes a genuine and unusual discovery. Okay, Bill, I found an area here that, well, this almost looks like it could have been a feeding area because there's a lot of open clams and a lot of shells and uh, hard to make out what some of this stuff is. A lot of broken shells. Well, what sort of predators do we have in this area, Dave? Well, we've got the, uh, the giant Pacific octopus, the biggest octopus in the world also live in this area. Is that right? <clears throat> yeah, they like to eat a lot of shellfish, but... Yeah, there is, a, there is a large number of uh, broken shells and uh, a lot of clams, a lot of them, more than an octopus would eat. That's, yeah, something's going on there. And what it was was a large clam that was open, empty, and then uh, started taking a look around, and it was just, the whole area was like a feeding frenzy was, was down there. Like, it, it was broken shells, uh, We've heard of all the sightings of caddy here. Could it be uh, the remains of the eating area? Uh, what does caddy really eat? Who knows? Uh, that was rather exciting, you know. I mean, we, we found a locale, certainly, uh, that looks like there was some type of predator that was feeding there. Um, it's in the exact location where most of the caddy sightings have been. And we may very well have found the exact area or the home of Caddy. The legend hunting team wraps up their sea monster expedition. During their search, they have made some important discoveries about both Ogopogo and Caddy. We've learned that, and we think that, Caddy and Ogopogo are related. We think that that relation is based on salmon runs, and we believe that Caddy got into the Okanagan Basin a number of years ago when there was a huge lake there called Lake Penticton, and it may have been open to the sea. And he followed the salmon up into the interior, into the basins, the Columbia Basin, the Fraser Basin, and when the lake got blocked off, he got caught there. And he became our Ogopogo, a direct cousin of Caddy. And they remain optimistic about the future of their quest. You know, we've developed some new technology uh, that we're going to be using this year. It's a, it's a whole different way of searching. And uh, we're hoping to get some pretty positive results from that. I think our team will probably It'll probably be the team that finds a conclusive proof. When they do find proof of these mysterious sea creatures, it will be a significant discovery for science. The scientific community uh, is gonna have to take a step back and have a look at what's going on in the freshwater lakes of North America. And, I mean, there's new species of animals being found all the time all over the world. I don't think it's unrealistic to uh, have a species that's here in this lake. For a legend hunter, the investigation is everything. And for Bill, it's no exception. His motives remain true. 
It's just, it's something that I have a great interest in. Well, we want to prove the existence of an undiscovered aquatic animal in Okanagan Lake. And I think it's time.